Um, so, Assalamu alaikum guys, I'm really happy to see that everyone's here. Um, today, alhamdulillah, we've got a webinar on emotional intelligence and Dr. Mahira Ruby will be our guest speaker tonight. Um, she's a teaching fellow at UCL, uh, mashallah, she's completed a PhD at Goldsmiths and she's a, per, a personal development coach and a parent educator, mashallah, amazing amount of qualifications and experience as well. And inshallah, we're going to learn a wide range of information and key skills about emotional intelligence, what it means and the importance of it all. And inshallah, I'll leave it all to you, Mahira Harubi. Okay. A'udhu billahi minash shaitan rajeem. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. As-salatu as-salamu ala rasuli al-kareem wa ala ahli wa ashabi ajma'in. Rabbi shahli sadri wa kirli amri wa ashla khudam li sani yaqa wa qawli. Assalamu alaikum everybody. Um, you're all, all on mute, uh, but in the comments, I'm sure you can uh, you can um, at least let us know if you can't hear us or hear me, and uh, and do join in. I want I would like this session to be interactive. Um, and Jazakallah, is it Maria who just introduced me? So hopefully, uh, you've got a, a bit of insight into um, what I do and. Uh, that will come through possibly a bit more as we as we go along, inshallah. So I've been asked to deliver this session on emotional intelligence, and um, I've been working uh, with families, young people, and uh, uh, mothers in particular, but also young people around um, parenting, uh, personal development. And time and time again, what comes through is um, our lack of ability in a way to uh, manage our emotional well-being, uh, which impacts on um, a lot of our other aspects of our life. Um, so I alhamdulillah agree to do this session uh, as a, and, and I hope it will uh, help you in, in just sort of identifying some of the things that um, add to our emotional intelligence, but also helps us to understand, our, understand ourselves better. Um, so what I wanted to do, um, as I said, I'd really like this session to be interactive. So do use the chat. Um, and if anybody wants to uh, say something, unmute yourself, put your hand up and uh, and do contribute. So it, for me, doing online stuff is, is still slightly new. So um, do bear with me if I uh, slip up a little bit. But Together we can get through this session, inshallah. We only have an hour, so we'll we'll plod along, inshallah. So first of all, I wanted to ask you um, to have a look at the these blobs, and I, I quite like these blobs uh, as they help us to sort of start a conversation. Um, uh, you know, so there's quite a few of us on here, so it'll, it'll help us to get to grips with uh, how we see individuals. So here you have a, a, a lot of uh, blobs and they have shadows. So what I'd like you to do is to look at these uh, shadows and try to see if you can uh, sort of think about these questions and we'll have a, I'll give you a minute or so to look at these blobs and then we'll, we'll uh, have a chat about these inshallah. So first of all, I hope everyone can see the blobs. And if you can't, just, um, or if you can't hear me, just say so on the chat. Okay, so from what you've seen of the blobs, which blob do you think is happy? Uh, just put a little description of the blob that you think seems happy to you. Uh, which one would you choose? And your first? Um, is it the one on the top, kind of middle right, is giving something to the other blue? So uh, if I point, is it this one? The one next to it? This one? Yeah, the one on the right, yeah. 
OK, so you think this one is happy. OK, that's fine. Um, anybody else? Which blob is sad? Any thoughts? No? So I'm not quite sure if people are able to unmute themselves or I need to. Can everyone can everyone hear me? Uh, and are you able to unmute yourself? So. I think you're muted. Everyone's muted at, at the other end. So which blob is sad? Which blob do you find interesting? Um, Which blob do you actually feel like? Which one, which uh, of these kind of represent how you're feeling maybe today or how you felt yesterday? Um, which blob will you actually keep away from, you'll try to avoid? And which blob will you not choose to have in your life? So are there, is there a particular blob that you would specifically keep away from and uh, not allow to uh, have in your life? So these are these are some questions that I tend to uh, ask um, in order just to gauge our uh, thinking. So I think I've been missing some of the chat. OK, so here uh, I think some people I have been sorry, I, I've had my chat on kind of minim minimized so I couldn't see. So some of you said that um, Bottom right corner, the two blobs hugging each other. They seem happy uh, for happy. The very bottom one in the middle, the saddest one is at the bottom. There's a cloud over. Uh, so this one, I'm guessing, um, is what you're saying is the one that's sad. Um, so what I wanted to do is if I if I ask your views on this blob, what would you suggest is going on? So what do you think is going on for this blob here? How would you? Um, so if you were to meet this person and you could see their shadow, what would your perception of the uh, be of this person? A fake person, OK. And why do you say that? Why would you think that this person is a fake person? And would you would you avoid this person? Would you befriend this person? Would you uh, allow them into your space? And then, so they present a good and positive ex exterior, but are actually not sincere and aren't so good on the inside. I would avoid. Okay, um, that's fine. Can you see the next blob that I've circled? What about this one? So you've kind of, somebody already said that um, they are sad. So you're saying that he looks like an angel, but his shadow says the opposite. Uh, OK, somebody's writing in a different language that I can't read. Oh, I mean, I can read it, but I don't understand. So hopefully somebody else can help with that. Um, so, yep, so this shadow, somebody has already said that, you know, they, they seem happy, but they, they, they could be sad. Uh, the next one I've circled is this one. What's your view on that one? How would you judge the, these people? All are looking for love. OK. Uh, that's really interesting. So they're all looking for love. Um, and the last one I have is this one. So what do you, what do you love triangle? OK, um, so what about the last one that I've just put a circle around? What's your view on that one? Uh, 
uh, yeah, body dysphoria comes to mind, I identity incongruence, so body image issues, the perceptions of, of themselves aren't fitting with the reality. Okay, so that's really, really great. So if I was to put a spin on this and say to you that this one here is actually, uh, they, they have possibly committed a lot of sins um, and they are really guilty. And so they are coming to a circle seeking uh, friendships where they can um, be around good influence. So this person is seeking um, redemption in a way, but also looking for a circle of people that will actually help them to uh, find a better path, uh, find um, companionship that will be good for them. So they want to leave this shadow behind. Yeah, so the, this devilish or whatever it's trying to represent, they want to leave that behind, but they want to come forward and um, uh, and change their ways. And this one, um, some of you have kind of said that or in, a, in a way as well, that they have a happy exterior, but actually they have a lot of sadness. So could this be somebody with bipolar, somebody who has depression, um, somebody who's high functioning, but also has uh, other issues that are going on uh, in their life. So that that could be that. Here, you're right, it could be the body image. Um, it's also how other people perceive them. So could this be these shadows be their their version of what other people see about them? And they don't know quite how to handle that. Um, and here, uh, as you can see, the, the heart here is fading. So somebody who's chasing love uh, and chasing happiness in other people. So it's it's kind of putting their, pinning their happiness on other people. But it because that journey is so difficult, the love actually fades from within them. And the, and the contentment, um, it, it kind of reduces, yeah? Um, so each of these shadows actually uh, bring a story with them. And my question to you at the beginning of the session would be that we also all have a shadow. Yeah, so we all we all have a shadow. Um, and how do we carry that shadow around with us? Um, and also, are we in control of the shadow that we have? Um, and finally, are, are, are there influences around us that kind of shape and reshape the shadows that we carry. So again, uh, how do the how do these shadows influence us, um, and also impact on our behaviour and our daily day to day life? Yeah. And I just wanted to put this out there just to get you thinking that sometimes we could be judging. So for instance, this one, a lot of people say that there's a lot of anger in this person, and they would avoid them like the plague. They're not good energy to have around you. Uh, but it could again be that. This person has a lot of, um, you know, experiences behind them that are uh, really intense. And again, they want to find calm and they, they're seeking calm and they're seeking, um, you know, sort of companionship again, that's going to give them a bit of relief from what they what they've left behind and what they are facing in their in their personal lives that they want to keep away from their public life. So these these shadows. Uh, in a way, how we read them uh, is a testimony to our emotional intelligence, which are based, which is based on our own experiences of how uh, we see certain experiences um, and and how we shape other people's experiences, how we uh, relate to them, how we uh, respond to them, um, and that that is a part of emotional intelligence. Yeah. So. Let me ask you this now. Um, what does emotional intelligence mean to you? So if you can just put up words uh, that defines emotional intelligence for you, what would they be? How would you define somebody with good emotional intelligence? What would their characteristics be? So type away. Or if you want to, if you want to share and you want to talk, feel free to do that as well. So wisdom, yeah. Somebody with wisdom uh, has emotional intelligence. One aspect would be a good regulation of their own emotions. That's great. Being able to express your feelings, uh, the ability to determine other people's feelings, 
someone that can understand and empathize. So the word empathy has come up here with others' feelings. That's great. Um, what if I was to say to you, a lot of this, you know, how would you know if somebody regulates their own emotions? Can you give an example of somebody who you know and, and have experienced that has managed to regulate their emotions? What indicates that somebody is regulating their own emotions? Okay, aren't reactionary, more mindful. That's great. Um, so there's there's a word cloud here around emotional empathy, uh, I mean emotional intelligence. And these are some of the words that are normally associated with good emotional intelligence. So there's compassion, there's awareness, uh, there's understanding, there's communication, uh, you're together, you're not isolated, you're, you're able to uh, communicate with people, interact with people. Um, you have, you know, worry is also here. Yeah. So what does worry look like? There's sadness here. There's so somebody with emotional intelligence. Do you think they won't know what these feelings mean, or uh, they they're not so familiar with those because they have moved on to all the other positive words, um, comforting gesture. Um, you know, they're charitable. So all these, they get, there's the, the people with positive intelligence, you know, emotional intelligence have hope, they're more hopeful, they're more positive. Now, my question is that as individuals, do we actually, um, what, is there a fine line between emotional intelligence and arrogance? So are there people sometimes that are, some people would consider having emotional intelligence but to others they would be individuals who are quite full of themselves and and they don't then they don't quite understand where you're coming from because they're too busy sharing their own experience does that indicate uh emotional intelligence yeah so hold that thought um i have something here and i want uh, your insight into this. So we all have a world as it is. So currently we have a world that we live in and each of our worlds can be very different. Um, our context is different. Our situations are different. And then there's a life that you would, you know, your life as you would like it to be. So my life as I would like it to be uh, would be very glossy, would have lots of positive things in it. Um, so what do you think creates a tension between our life as it is? So if you were to say some things in your life at the moment, how would you describe your life as it is? Again, just, you know, type in some words that would describe your life as it is at the moment. How would you describe your life as it is? Busy, stressful, okay. I can't find the right word in English, that's fine. Um, okay, anything else? What would you like your life to be like? So meeting the expectations of me, but perhaps not achieving what I would fully be capable of. Yeah, so that's that's the kind I think that you're referring to your life as it is. What would you like your life to be in the future? So if you're looking at three years ahead or five years ahead, where would you like to be your life as you would like it to be if you could uh, fulfill all your dreams? What would that life look like? Good. So currently your life is stirring. So there's lots of things going on. Um, it's active. So you would like a peaceful life. Great. What else would we like in our life? Contentment. Yeah. Anything else? So peaceful and contentment covers quite a nice, you know, uh, scenario 
for where we, were, where we would like our life to be. So what, what's the tension? What creates the tension? So same for you, yeah, best scenario. So the life that we have now that is stressful, that is, you know, overwhelming, and we've got lots of things stirring in our life, and we want to be in this part of our life, what do you think creates this gobbledygook? So kind of this tension, this scribble, this tangle that we have. Uh, what sort of things create the tension? Why can we not achieve this? What are the barriers? Wanting things to be different than they are, not really accepting the present, being too much too thoughtful, yeah? So we overthink some things in our life at the moment. But in terms of barriers that you face, what kind of things do you think really stop us from reaching out to having the life we want? <clears throat> so not knowing exactly how to change entrenched behavior and mindset, uh, that are difficult to alter. That's true. Communication with others. So not being able to communicate what we want is a big barrier to reaching our life as it is, uh, you know, as we want it um, in the future. Um, one of the biggest things uh, that that stops us actually reaching for the other side to go to this end are the external messages that have become our inner voice. Yeah. So people around us, ourselves, um, situations, experiences that kind of happen to us uh, and that end up being our inner voice that says to us, this can't be, this is just a dream. This is unreal, this is unrealistic, uh, you're, you're hoping for something that is impossible. And the thing that actually builds from that is our ego. Yeah. So we've got something that is known as the ego. Um, so when you think about our ego, it's actually built on an image that is created by voices around us, behaviors around us, um, that shapes our inner voice that says to us, you're just being really silly. You know, how can you wish for a life of a big house and car and what else? And just contentment when you know your present situation is so dire or, um, there is just no hope because the world is so horrible. People won't allow you to reach that uh, state of contentment. The world is too troublesome for us to do that. So we've got all this going on, and this is all shaped by social media, um, your elders, your family life, your important others that are in your life, your friendship circles. So we are. there are very few people who actually enable us to Think of all the skills and qualities and gifts that we have, juggle them, bring some to the fore and bring some to uh, the forefront and to be able to reach out, to be able to go here. And this is our emotional intelligence. So to be able to go from our ego, and ego is a seen as a negative thing because it's a blocker. Yeah, so ego is a blocker that stops us often uh and when we say to ourselves really can you do that honestly do you have the skills um will people accept you are you going to be socially uh accepted yeah so all of those questions even though we know we may have the skills we may have all of this our ego pulls us back into the negativity often although there's lots of positives that are going on in our life and that's what we're going to unpack a bit today um, we drown ourselves in the negativity because our ego pulls us there, yeah? So how do we use our emotional intelligence and build on the positives here to build a mindset that helps us to actually push ourselves slowly forward through this craziness and maze to be able to achieve some of this because it is possible uh, to be able to do that. And Santala guarantees that, that if you take a step towards me, I will run towards you. Yep. So it's about taking those positive steps and how do we do that? And that's the purpose of this session uh, today. So just a, a few definitions uh, that are uh, around is that, um, you know, how emotional intelligence is def defined. It's a capacity for recognizing our own feelings and those of others, for motivating ourselves and 
and for managing emotions effectively in others and ourselves. So it's actually knowing yourself and how, you know, this is by Daniel, but what does the Quran say about that? So the Quran actually says about emotional intelligence that whoever knows himself knows his Lord. So emotional intelligence is a part of this, the self-awareness. And when you are self-aware, you are able to be motivated because you know your strengths, you know your weaknesses, you know your limitations, but you also know what your opportunities are. Yeah. And uh, so that leads you to motivation, motivation to pull yourself forward rather than your ego pulling you back. You start to train your ego. Yeah. Um, and Prophet Islam actually trained his ego. If you think about when he first received the revelation, uh, where he was in the cave by himself, he was petrified. So what were some of the questions he was asking himself? Am I good enough? Yeah, so when he came home, ran home, covered himself under his blanket, um, and he was shivering from fear, he was asking questions that we ask ourselves. Am I good enough? What has happened to me? Am I going crazy? Am I, you know, what has possessed me? And what um, what Khadija did was to be able to rebuild his self-awareness about himself, which built his empathy. So she used empathy to build his self-awareness. So she said to him, you're a good person. You are kind to your relatives. You are there for people who need you. You are giving. You are serving. So those kind of things built his social skills. To be able to regulate those negativities, which again, he became self-aware that he can go and fulfill his mission. So I hope this cycle makes sense to you with that example that have, through Prophet Sallallahu example, we can also, it's okay to go through self-doubt, but we have to have the resilience, and that's what we're going to touch on today, to be able to go through this process, you know, use the empathy, what does empathy look like? Go through that and rebuild our self-awareness so we can go through the cycle again. Um, so we can, you know, we can be blind followers, we can be bl the blind faithful, but actually the, the kind of follower Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from us is, to, is the one that knows themselves, yeah? knows what it means to worship, knows what it means to be uh, a, a, an obedient servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Where is it coming from? And that is built on this verse from the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, indeed, he succeeds, he purifies his own self. If you don't know who you are, you don't know what to purify. Yeah? There, it's difficult to purify if you, if you don't know who you are. And where is the motivation to purify? So again, these two are so interlinked. And the, the, the last hadith I wanted to share was, is that when um, Prophet Islam said, love for your brother what you love for yourself. Yeah. So again, it comes back to if you don't know what you love for yourself, you actually don't know what you need to do for your brother. OK, so again, it's em it's highlighting the uh, aspect of empathy. Now, some people might say, well, actually, that hadith sounds quite selfish, that it's asking you to look at yourself first. What if the brother doesn't like what you love for yourself? How are you going to do that? You know, why would you go and do that for your uh, brother? But actually, the empathy is if you know what you love for yourself, you're able to read other people better. So being able to look at those blobs and to be able to have a few um, stories behind each blob is showing you have emotional intelligence. So there isn't a one picture for one shadow uh, and one we don't all come with a version of ourselves. We have uh, a, a complex um, identity and depending on where we are in which context we're in, we tend to display a different uh, side to ourselves. OK, so um, these are some of the definitions. And this little thing here says be aware of the emotions of others and use this to um, regulate your behavior, guide your, our own behavior. OK, so I hope that made a bit of sense. So I wanted to move on to this, um, and I hope this is really helpful because this has taken me a long time to formulate uh, from my experience of doing various courses. So here, uh, what I wanted to ask you, first of all, um, is 
can you give me an example of uh, of somebody you know that is very selfless? Can you share an example of a person who is selfless? Or, you're, or, or there's an expectation for them to be selfless. So give an example of somebody either you know who's selfless but or who you expect selflessness from. Mothers, okay, great. Thank you. Anyone else? Daughters? Oh. Other someone has created us uh, with exceptional qualities. So mothers and daughters. So would you say then that the fathers and sons generally are not selfless? Is that what that's implying? Okay. So we have mothers, we have daughters. Any other examples? So in in uh, in a community context, is there anyone that you can think of that we expect to be selfless? A leader, okay. So, uh, so you a I don't I don't know your name. Sorry. So you said mothers, yeah. Um, how many mothers do we know uh, that? Um, how long do you think that selflessness lasts in a mother? Or a leader. What generally tends to happen to people who are selfless? From your experience. So selflessness is uh, an, a, a characteristic of selflessness is that they, they give, they give and they give and they don't ex expect anything much back. Fantastic. So a selfless person, actually, there's resentment builds in them, but also they tend to burn out, yeah? For a mother, their selflessness lasts their whole life for their children at least. It's a lifetime commitment, that's great. But do they, uh, can they sustain the same amount of energy throughout their selflessness, selfless life or with ups and downs, yeah? So do you know anybody in your life or you, you've come across anyone who's selfish, who do they tend to be? Examples of people who are selfish. Okay, a mother's journey is a marathon and not a quick sprint. Men, okay, so that's fine. So let me give you an ex <laughs> joking, not joking, that's fine. So that's an interesting example. So if we use that example, so a mother raising a son, yeah, uh, and uh, this this is shaped by our culture, our understanding of faith, our personal views and paradigms of where we think the role of men and women are. So a mother raising a son and a daughter, and it relates to how you've kind of said that a daughter is selfless. So is she remodeling the character of her mother? Yeah, so that's the model of a, a woman she has in her life. So she just recycles that, um, recycles that uh, behavior. So they, she also ends up being selfless. Um, so a mother raising a son and a daughter. So if, if the son, uh, and I'll give you a very stereotypical example. And, uh, and I'm, I'm sad to say that although it's stereotypical, I see that a lot in the parenting uh, services that I offer that in the parenting courses that I offer that it's still quite prominent so the sons will be expected to be the man of the house in a way they're not expected to do a lot of the chores in the house maybe when they're younger but as they get older it kind of wears off so when you have a selfless person uh, so the selfless mother actually produces a very selfish child yeah. So the scenario that I have, uh, I get a lot, is a, a selfless mother who's given her child everything, sleepless nights, cooking, cleaning, laundry. Um, when the child turns about 12, 13, and the ma mother asks for some support, 
the child doesn't understand what they're expecting. Yeah? So you've done this all your life. Why do you want me to do anything now? I, I don't know how to do it. So they will refuse. They, they, they will not have the uh, courtesy. Yeah, spoiled kids. So that they, they will not have the courtesy to be able to respond to that mother and say, yeah, I know how to help. Because they actually don't know how to help. If they've never done the dishes, if they've never hoovered, if they've never ironed their own clothes, they actually don't know. So the, the easiest route to take is to say, I'm not going to do it or I can't do it. Yeah, so they, they build that. Uh, so being selfless doesn't actually help. So when sometimes in Islam we think that as a Muslim we need to be selfless. Actually, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, just as the verses in the, the hadith that we've shared, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala expects us to be self-aware. Yeah, the self-awareness relates to other uh, characteristics that build and when we think about emotional intelligence. Here, if you think about the selfish child or the selfish individual, they are very in independent, which is a characteristic of raising a child in the West. We want them to be in independent. We want them to stand on their own two feet. So the language we use tend to push them into a corner where they are uh, fending for themselves. So they don't actually value other people. So when you think about here not valuing others, they don't think other people uh, have a role in their life or have contributed to their development, which creates apathy. So a sense of, you know, uh, there isn't, they just mean this. So what's the point of me going and voting? What's the point of me going and wanting to, they don't even need to feel the need to go and change anything. Um, here it says, but would a, would a selfless mother who has raised a child that is pious with a sound understanding of Islam still be selfish? Yes. Yes, they will. They will be a worshipper on their own. They will not carry others with them in that worship. So they'll be very um, conscious of their own needs, but not the needs of others. So this apathy is, is very much a part of that. And then if you look at the selfless person, yeah, the selfless person actually tr tends to create codependency. Um, so the codependency is that that person will always rely on this person. And when something goes wrong, the tendency is for that person to blame that person. So the blame culture is very much in this relationship. Yes, yeah, so the, the codependent person. This person here who is selfless acts from a place of sympathy. So they feel sorry for that child. They feel sorry for that uh, adult. And they will do things that they think is needed in that person's life. So you act on an emotion that is not necessarily related to the other person. And then you, you build a cocoon around that person where they become very codependent on this individual and they don't know how to uh, relate. So when that person doesn't depend on them anymore and they move away because they become selfish, yeah, uh, this person starts to resent these people that they've been serving. So somebody's asking here, don't uh, isn't the keystone of the house but a pillar among others. That's what my big brother told me. Yeah. Uh, I'm not quite sure what that means. If you can clarify a bit more, that would be really helpful. So this selfless person, you know, when you give and give and give and give, you end up being resentful towards the people that are not appreciating what you are doing because ultimately you're creating um, selfish people. OK, so the sympathy here isn't really very helpful. And I'm just really conscious of time, actually. It's flying by quite fast. Now, if we think about emotional intelligence and you've mentioned empathy, the person who is self-aware will create an aura around them that it, it, that is interdependent. So the aura is I need help. I know how to seek help as a person. I know when to seek help. Yeah, went to seek help. So I have people who are in my life that can help me, but I'm also helping people in my life, those around me. And it's based on a premise of empathy because we understand each other. We understand what it's like somehow to be in that person's shoes because we've experienced, because we've lived in each other's life a little bit, we, we experience what the tensions are and what the reliefs are as well, that we can help each other through that. So you build a circle of support where if there isn't shame in seeking help. There isn't shame in expressing your emotions. There isn't a shame 
in sharing responsibility and saying that, you know, I'm not managing, can you help? So here uh, in the comments, somebody's saying that sharing the task responsibilities among each other is to delegate. So you delegate appropriately. You don't delegate so much that you're not doing anything. Yeah, so there's, there's a share and care that's happening within that relationship. Now, this relationship builds something that is really interesting, which is uh, I just wanted to highlight to you the difference between sympathy and empathy. What sympathy creates, yeah, what sympathy creates is pessimism, uh, hot anger. So when, when we are giving, 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 and there's a time that, you know, I want something back, you react in heat. Because you've built up, you've bottled up a lot of pessimism. You've bottled up, you know, your ego has been bashed and smashed and thrown around. You rationalize, you start to rationalize, you know, I need to do this for this person because they're so incapable. Otherwise, I, there's no need for me here. You know, I know there are times when, as a mother, I've said, well, would this house run if I wasn't here? Um, would this friendship have any worth if I wasn't here? I'm giving so much. But at the end of the day, will I be missed? If I'm not here, if I'm not in this relationship, in this life, will I actually be missed? And then the anger rises, yeah? So th there's two types of anger. One is hot anger, one is cold anger. So what we tend to often do is react from a place of hot anger, which is very pessimistic, full of passion, that we lose, it's full of emotion and passion, and we lose what we're doing. Um, we rationalize that anger later, uh, based on our ego, you know, I was hurt. That person attacked me, and therefore I had to react in that way. Whereas empathy is very, very different. Empathy actually comes from a place of gratitude. And that gratitude calms hot anger into a cold, calm anger, which is purposeful, creates hope, builds relationships. Now, I don't know if this makes sense to you. I hope it does. That if you can think of empathy, somebody with emotional intelligence that has been able to empathize with others, doesn't mean that they don't have anger. They do have anger, but that anger is very well regulated because it's a purposeful anger. They, they want action out of this uh, situation that will have create hope, not lose that relationship, but it's built on a place of gratitude. And when it's like this, it's easier to uh, forgive, it's easier to empathize, it's easier to keep quiet sometimes, to let go, yeah? So there are often times when you sit there and you think, how am I going to behave towards that person, yeah? Next time I see that person, these are the words I'm going to use, this is how I'm going to behave, I'm going to be really cold, I'm going to be really reactionary, and it doesn't help because you break relationships. What empathy creates is a circle of support around you that is based on positive relationships. Okay, so I'm just going to do a couple more slides and then uh, we'll go into um, some questions if you have any. So the ego, as we mentioned, is based within uh, the sympathy realm and the apathy realm. So a lot of this dictates what goes on in our heart, uh, in our head. Yeah, so our brain is. Uh, overwhelmed by a lot of this. So am I losing my power? Am I the victim? Am I being denied? There's a lot of resentment. Am I crazy? Actually, you get some, you become stuck. The pride is uh, impacted on. Um, so there's a negative sense of pride where there's jealousy. It's based on jealousy. Uh, so a lot of this actually uh, impacts on our, the way we think. To move from ego to our soul, and interesting, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there's a verse that says, in the remembrance of Allah does the heart find rest. So we, empathy, actually is generated from the soul. Yeah? And if we can tame our heart with dhikr, with the remembrance of Allah, with genuine feeling, because we have good people around us, you have all of these things that build from uh, that, that notion of uh, I belong, I belong to... A, a context, a situation, uh, and, and there's an understanding. And then the heart starts to shape, reshape the ego. Yeah, so there's a, there's a fluid relationship between these two. And they both exist in all of us. So we need to train our soul 
to be in a place of empathy, which can shape our ego to be at a better place. Okay. Um, so here, you know, the, most of relationships are based on, you, you, they may forget what you said, but they will never forget how you made them feel. A lot of us will, from interactions, what we take away are feelings. Um, however, our strong, strong our minds are, we actually take away the feelings that are created by people. And I just wanted to end with these two couple of verses before we go on to uh, a discussion, uh, you know, questions you have. So the first is invite to the way of your Lord with wisdom. That's the word that uh, somebody used right at the beginning of the session. So empathy is when you have wisdom. Wisdom comes from experience and good instruction. So uh, invite to the way of your Lord. So when you're conversing with other people, have wisdom. Uh, and good instruction. So the way you talk to each other, let the, let there be empathy in that, and argue with them in a way that is best. So there's no harm in arguing, but there's a way of arguing. Somebody with hot anger will argue with passion, but lose track. But somebody with cold anger will argue with reason. Yeah, will argue with uh, reason that is conducive to both. It's a relational argument. Um, indeed, your Lord is most knowing of who has strayed from his way and he's most knowing of who is rightly guided. And I love the second verse, which is, oh, you who have believed, let not a people ridicule another people. Perhaps they may be better than them, nor let women ridicule other women. Perhaps they may be better than them and do not insult one another and do not call each other by offensive nicknames. Wretched is the name of disobedience after one's faith. And whoever does not repent, then it is those who are the wrongdoers. This is. Uh, a prescription in how we need to build our uh, emotional intelligence. So if we can keep away from these aspects of ridiculing other people, belittling other people, because if you think about our ego, sometimes it makes us feel that if I can belittle somebody else, I will look better in an argument. If I can push somebody else down, then I will look higher. Actually, we don't. People don't like people like that. And slowly people, your circle of support starts to diminish because you emanate, you kind of give off negative energy. So these are the things that we need to avoid in order to be, um, develop sympathy, uh, sorry, empathy, which will build our emotional intelligence. And emotional intelligence actually builds on a place of gratitude. And that's what Islam encourages us to do. So every morning, Every night before we go to sleep, when we wake up, we should start from a place of gratitude and that gratitude will shape our eyes to see what we need to see positive, our ears to hear positive, our senses to sense the positive in people before we kind of shred them apart and take the negative negative uh, from them. So this is kind of my take on emotional intelligence and I hope uh, that's given you some kind of uh, an idea of how we can start to build and rebuild and consolidate our uh, emotional intelligence just to be able to take a step back and read people better and and where professor you know um professor sam also says that make 70 excuses for your brother if you don't start from a place of gratitude it's very difficult to make excuses for other people because what's working is your hot anger um, and the the quickest thing to do is to judge that person and to rationalize their behavior and say that wasn't right and you did mean justice and then the cycle starts yeah so I'll, I'll conclude here uh inshallah so if you if there are any comments um or questions you have uh i'm i'm happy to take take that inshallah um and it would also be nice to know if you found it useful what effort was uh, was there anything new you you got from the session uh, that will that will be great for my self esteem. <laughs> Inshallah. Any questions? Any clarifications? Any corrections? Please. Any challenges you want to make? Please feel free to do so. Does resilience have anything to do with emotional intelligence? Yes, definitely. So, what emotional intelligence builds is your re resilience to cope with the difficult times. So emotional intelligence, it's the way I see emotional intelligence is a self-talk. What do we say to ourselves during the good times? And most importantly, what do, I, what do we say to ourselves when we're going through tough times? So resilience is being able to um, say to yourself, I can come out of this. What are the resources I need to 
um, dip into what resources do I have? So it goes back to the hadith that says, you know, um, to know to know Allah, you need to know yourself. Yeah. So what is it that I have? What are your gifts? I would encourage all of you actually to sit and and write down all the gifts and talents that you have, all the skills that you've been blessed with. Uh, and they have a meaning. They have a purpose. So when we're going through tough times, it's those things that we dip into to be able to come out and the emotional intelligence to be able to have that self-talk and be able to say to ourselves, I've got enough within me to overcome this hurdle. How can we build resilience? It's, a lot of it is practice. Um, and so when you are in a difficult situation, remind yourself to be positive and positive self-talk. What would if sometimes when you can't find the good in yourself, say to yourself, what would my best friend say? What would my better self say to me? What would they say to me in this situation? What would they see in me that I'm not seeing in myself? Yeah. And that will build your resilience. How would you advise building self-awareness and acceptance of oneself, not allowing it to be influenced by external things such as the environment or other people? Um, try to find, you know, that we are encouraged to have two levels of friendships, one that will inform our well-being and another that where we will inform their well-being, yeah, impact on their well-being. So we should have two groups of people around us that uh, will enable us to grow because it, you will grow from both interactions. So if you want to build self-awareness, um, I would encourage you to self-evaluate. So we are encouraged to do muhasaba. So before you go to sleep, um, yes, mindfulness is muhasaba. So in a way, before you go to sleep, reflect on your day, what has gone well, what has helped it to go well, what did you do that helped that day to go well? Um, what is it that you can do to help the next day to be better? So always having little, little goals that you can aspire to, to achieve. Don't make your goals so big that they, they are overwhelming. So have little things. Process time said that um, actions are good that are little and consistent. So start with the little things that you can build in your life that will improve um, your not only your self-awareness, but your resilience, your self-esteem. So there's a fine line between self-esteem and arrogance as well. Self-esteem is knowing yourself well enough to be able to function in a social setting without putting anybody else down. You don't need to put anybody else down in order to build yourself. Mm -hmm. And that's really key to understand. So does mindfulness assist in, yes, it does. Um, uh, sorry, I think I already said that. So yes, Mohasaba is really self-reflection, keeping a journal, so do keep a journal if you can, daily journal of what happened, uh, what uh, and and uh, distance yourself from yourself if you can and say, you know, what would I say to myself in a positive way? What would I say to myself to improve myself? So be your best friend, if uh, your critical friend if you can, uh, and and don't beat yourself up. So is it okay to keep distance from people in general if human interactions exhaust us? Is it linked to too much self-awareness or the ability to empathize too much with people? You definitely need the self-preservation is very, very important. So you need to look after yourself. If there are people around you that are draining, uh, take bite size uh, of those, you know, of those interactions. Um, uh, so you may, because of your the energy you you give off, you may draw certain people to yourself. So if your energy is very accommodating, giving, just make sure that you're not becoming the selfless individual where you lose sleep, you lose, you're not eating, you're not doing anything, you know, all those things to take care of yourself. Self-awareness is having a balance. Uh, and, and that balance is often hard. But, you know, we, we yo-yo between the world as it is and the world as it should be. And, and it's a healthy yo-yoing that needs to happen. If you're too much in one area, you need to find ways. And some people need, you know, there are some of us who need coaching. We need counselling. And that's OK. Some of us need to be able to heal before we can become self-aware because we're so entrenched in our negative experiences that it's really hard to find ourselves. So some of us, it's OK to seek that help. And it's mental health is so important in Islam. 
um, and look, Professor Islam went to, uh, uh, Khadija Anha took Professor Islam to Barira. Why did she need to do that? Just so that somebody else can say you are okay. You need to look after yourself. So it is okay to seek help. Um, and, you know, Professor Islam continues to did that with his companions. So we, um, so, you know, when Professor Islam, somebody wanted to, me to elaborate on that. So when he received the revelation and um, they were not quite sure what was happening, they went to a relative who was a Christian monk. And um, and, the, and then the Christian monk actually reiterated to them that uh, Professor Islam is gifted. He's got troubles coming ahead of him um, and to be able to. And, you know, he wished that he would be around to support the Professor Islam when those times came. So it kind of reinforced what they already kind of identified that it was a unique event that took place in the cave. So he, they reached out, they, you know, Professor Islam took Khadija with her, him, she took him with her to go and see this relative. So we, if we need friends to support us, that is fine. We need to, we need to reach out and we need to be that friend as well. Sometimes when friends, friends share things with us, we kind of brush it off and say, oh, don't be silly. Um, it's okay to do that sometimes, but actually we need to listen to people when they're sharing uh, things about themselves where they're not at a good place. And to be able to listen and to be able to say to them, it's okay to seek help. Yeah. Um, and to be able to do that is it's a gift. Uh, not every, everybody is. And that's also a sign of resilience. If you're able to go and seek help, it shows that you've got something in you that's pushing you to do that and that's a part of the resilience that's the first step to indicate that you have good uh, self-awareness that you, you you've acknowledged that you need help and you're moving forward okay so yeah be 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 aware of people but be conscious that you could be the person that could also help them um so knowing yourself is also being able to carve a relationship that you're helping each other so it's interdependent it's mm -hmm. not draining one at the expense of the other all right great can you answer the question about the process from apathy to empathy yeah so apathy to empathy so if you have um sometimes we have very privileged we can see it as very privileged upbringing so we haven't actually needed to feel any want. So we haven't had anything that we had to do without. Um, Alhamdulillah has blessed us, uh, some of us that we have been through a journey where things have fallen into place uh, at the right time, at the right place. So how can you move from apathy to empathy is um, God consciousness. So again, you won't know you're apathetic. It's people around you that can uh, highlight that for you. So again, in terms of us being friends, companions, family members, um, if you see that it's the codependent relationship that has created the apathy, we need to retrain ourselves to the way we interact with that person. So the best way I know how to move from apathy to empathy is to start getting involved. So doing things that will help you to empathize with the other person. So if you can encourage that individual, sometimes, you know, um, people offer you help and you say, no, 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 it's fine. I can do it by myself. If that person is apathetic and they offer help for the sake of offering help, take help from that person. Yeah, take help from that person get them to carry the shopping. I mean, these are really basic examples. Get them to come into your life and help you with the housework. Um, you know, sit there with you, listen to some of your stories and enable them to feel uh, certain emotions that they may not have felt. Yeah. And it does start in the family. I mean, a lot of these uh, characteristics are rooted in the family, how we were raised what kind of a context we were raised in, what, what kind of parenting style uh, our parents had when they raised us. Um, and there were companions, you know, process time encouraged certain companions to take part in charitable things. 
So if you think about the, you know, the 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 migration, the hijra, when Prophet said the relationship between the Ansar and the Muhajirs, why did he have to say that you have to share? Why, you know, that that you have to give, you have to share, because that breeds the brotherhood and the sisterhood. When you have to give something that you love, so the person who is who's apathetic, encouraging them to give in charity, and charity doesn't mean they're extra, which will be for the a person who's apathetic, but is actually giving up something that they love. So giving up things that you, and it will be difficult to start with, but if you have a circle of support around you, you can move somebody from apathy to empathy. And also people from sympathy to empathy. It's I find it sometimes really, really difficult to move mothers who are very, very giving to start delegating and becoming self-aware that they're not the beginning and end of everything what happen? what will happen to them if Sunday Allah takes them how will that child survive to slowly start to give responsibility to their children so that they can you know a child would only know how backbreaking housework is if they do a bit of it yeah so it's experiences empathy is built on experiences which builds gratitude and that's that's a very very simple explanation you can't be grateful if you don't know what you're missing. So you don't know what light is if you haven't experienced darkness. So with with people who are quite selfish, they just know how to take. Um, and and to be able to say to them, no, you can't have this at this time, is to build slowly starts to build the empathy in them. Inshallah. I hope that that explains or answers that question. It's very difficult to do something like that in such a short amount of time. Um, yes, it's a day-to-day -day commit commitment, definitely. So, adhkar, dhikr, um, offering to help, um, doing things for yourself sometimes. Do you get me time? So, how do we? How we? Sometimes I ask people, how do you reward yourself when you've achieved something? Is that being selfish? When you are rewarding yourself, the reward starts from gratitude that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has enabled me to achieve this today. Uh, and I need to feel good about that. I need to, otherwise you can't show gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, so I don't know if there's any further questions or clarifications or comments. I'd just like everyone to, uh, if possible, to just write one word to describe how they're feeling after the session. Or actually two words. If you can just think back to before the session started, how you felt and how you feel now. And that would be really uh, helpful. Great, that's lovely. Feeling empowered. Anyone else? That's one for empowered and intrigued. It's such an interesting topic. Yes, it is. It's 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 really mm -hmm. fascinating, and it's amazing how uh, Subhanallah Islam is so in tune with our emotions, um, and how it the 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 actions that we have to do on a daily basis, how it helps us to uh, regulate our emotions as well. Our well being. Okay, grateful for the many reminders. Thank you. Do you have any material suggestions to learn more about this topic? Um, I really find the book by Hamza Yusuf, uh, Purification of the Heart. I think that's the book. I'm just trying to look to see the title. So he, he has written a book, uh, Purification of the Heart, I believe. It's a really, really lovely book. Um, and I find that really helpful um there's another book um uh, i forget uh but that 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 book is really helpful um if you can uh, i think you can find the pdf of hamza's book online possibly um but it, what i would encourage you all to do is actually 
write down little, little, first of all, what I asked you to, if you can, what I asked before, is to actually write down all the gifts and talents and uh, skills that you've been given by the Samatha and you've been able to acquire over time. Um, make a list of that. And then uh, each day to have a little goal to have that you would like to achieve the following day. Um, and that, that will slowly start to improve um, your your development, inshallah, and and progress in in that field. Okay, so unless there's anything more, I guess we can end the session here. Uh, thank you so much, Jazakallah Khair, for everybody who was able to join. Um, I uh, really enjoyed the session, and thank you for being interactive and um, putting your thoughts down. I hope you really found the session useful. Inshallah, keep me in your du'as. And yeah, I, I look forward to meeting you uh, in different spaces, inshallah. Uh, may you have a, a good journey uh, and, uh, you know, and develop well. And may Allah enable us all to take care of our, of our emotional health and develop our emotional intelligence, inshallah. Subhanakallah wa bihamdik. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilaik. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.